All right, so yeah, Nick asked me if I could speak, and I needed that little push, so thank you, Nick. This is the first time I've done this, so very excited to be here today. Um, and I thought, why not talk about death? This is dark, this is dark futures. Let's talk about the future of death. And um, so Nick's, Nick emailed me. He's like, I need, I need your topic title. I need to know your summary. What are you going to talk about? And that's when I realized that I'd opened a huge can of worms because death is such a huge topic, and there's so many different avenues you can go in. What am I going to focus on in this talk? There was one thing that I knew I didn't want to focus on. Can anyone guess what that would be? Any guesses? Nope. <laughs> I didn't want to focus on organized religion. And that's not because I'm against it or anything like that, but because as much as there might be an opportunity for coexistence of religion, there's also a lot of contradiction. And I didn't want to deal with all the contradictions among all the organized religions, so I thought, let's just avoid that. But what am I going to talk about? Where is my inspiration going to come from? And then it hit me. Oops. Who knows, show of hands, what this is? Ooh, many less than I expected. OK, everybody with your hand down, I'm going to spoil the best episode of Black Mirror for you tonight. And I have no guilt about it. Because it's from season three, it's been out for ages. And it is amazing. You should have seen it by now, especially if you're here at Dark Futures. So I'm not sorry. So that's my inspiration. The inspiration from San Junipero leads me to the topic, which is immortality or eternal life. What is humanity's obsession with immortality? I'm sure everyone in this room has their own ideas, their own hypothesis about our, our obsession with immortality. And I'm going to give some examples throughout history that show that this isn't a new thing. Humanity has been obsessed with immortality for a long time. Personally, I think it's tied with, to our ego. And this inability to let go, this idea that we can go through our entire lives amassing knowledge and skill, and that it can all just be snuffed out in a moment. First example, the Book of the Dead. So if we all go, go all the way back to the Egyptian Empire, you have the Book of the Dead, which is, book is what Egyptologists have, the best term they've come up with. But it's really a collection of texts from the Egyptian Empire, uh, really spells to help a dead person's journey through the underworld and into the afterlife. This smiling guy right here, this is Ramses II, also known as Ramses the Great, uh, widely recognized as, as the most powerful pharaoh in Egyptian history from the 19th, dyna 19th dynasty. And the Egyptians valued their pharaohs so highly that they would entomb them in the Valley of the Kings after their death where they were fiercely protected, and that's because they were still worshipped into the afterlife. If they had known that there would be seven floods in the space where they buried Ramses II, they might have put him somewhere else. It's actually been suggested that it was the worst possible place in Egypt they could have put the Valley of the Kings, but how were they to know? So spirituality, that's the first example. Let's talk about art. Does anyone know this woman's name? Lisa Gerardini. And why do we know about her? We know about her because Leonardo da Vinci painted her between 1503 and 1506, immortalizing her, creating the most one of the most valuable paintings in the history of the world, but immortalizing Lisa Gherardini. This is a statue in Montreux, Switzerland. It's a statue of Freddie Mercury, one of my favorite rock artists. Freddie Mercury, prior to his death, Queen had bought a recording studio in Montreux because they loved the setting in Montreux so much. It's really beautiful. This is right on the edge of Lac Léman or Lac Genève, depending on who you ask. But Freddie is, is forever immortalized with this bronze statue, and people can go and visit him and commemorate his life and what he gave to the world and what he gave to music. So we have art as another example. Let's move on to the slightly more macabre. Does anyone know who this is? Phantom. Thank you. What you're looking at is the well, the skeleton of Jeremy Bentham is underneath. There's a wax mask on top, stuffed with straw. And down at the bottom is Jeremy Bentham's mummified head. So when Jeremy Bentham died, he left a detailed letter along with his will that said that he wanted his disciple, whose name I now forget, to basically uh, dissect and preserve his body. Uh, it's believed that, well, Bentham was anti-religious, and it's believed that this was his way of thumbing his nose at the church. Anyway, his body is still on display in University College of London, except the head's not there anymore. And that's because his dis the Jeremy Bentham's disciple wasn't really the best at mummification, and this is what the head now looks like. 
So it hasn't really aged well. Also, it became the source of many student pranks since it was introduced at the University of College London in 1850, I believe. Uh, so they decided that they needed to put it in a more secure space. All right, so taxidermy. <laughs> Next. One of my favorite movies of all time. I just wanted to have an Austin Powers slide in here, but cry cryogenics, the idea that we can freeze our bodies until a, future, a time in the future when whatever is killing us or has killed us will have been resolved. One of the more famous stories or rumors is about Walt Disney. Walt Disney, many people don't know, but Walt, Walt Disney was a habitual smoker and he was diagnosed with lung cancer and had approximately one month between diagnosis and death. And in that month, uh, members of his team were researching cryogenics so rapidly that there were rumors that have persisted for years that Walt Disney's body is actually cryogenically frozen below the Pirates of the Caribbean ride at Disneyland. It's a myth. Walt Disney was cremated. He's not actually frozen at, at Disneyland, but still a very cool story. So we have cryogenics, AKA corpsicles. Corpsicles comes from a um, sci-fi series uh, referencing the Bobaverse. It's about a story named Bob. He was cryogenically frozen and they refers to, the, to those who are cryogenically frozen as corpsicles. I just thought that was quite funny. All right, next example, Albert Einstein. Widely regarded as one of the greatest minds in history. Uh, his mind was so special that it's, it was studied while he was alive, reluctantly, and even while he was dead, more reluctantly. You see, Einstein's brain was stolen. Uh, when he died in Princeton University, the pathologist that was on duty stole Albert Einstein's brain. It was only after that he got a very reluctant, uh, retroactive approval from Albert Einstein's son to keep the brain. And it was based on the, um, the agreement that it would only be used to advance science. So this pathologist actually took the brain from Princeton University Hospital to his home in Philadelphia, cubed it up into 240 pieces, uh, preserved it, and kept it in his basement. The story actually gets darker, but I don't have that much time, so go and look it up. It involves William S. Burroughs. It gets really nasty. Anyway, so neuroscience, the study of the brain. And this brings us to San Junipero. So for anyone who's not seen it, you can go earmuffs right now, and uh, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about the story, I'm not gonna ruin the entire thing, but San Junipero is the fourth episode in the third series of the Black Mirror um, show that's been created by Charlie Booker. And it's the story of Yorkie on the left, who's a shy girl visiting this beach resort town in, in the 1980s, who meets Kelly on your right. Kelly's very outgoing and gregarious. Anyway, they fall in love after numerous meetings, but you know, unlike other Black Mirror episodes, this one's not as dark, it's a bit of a love story, and that's one of the reasons why I like it. It's different from the rest. But there's always something in the background throughout this episode where things aren't quite right. Um, you know, Yorkie's saying, is this real? Is this, is this actually real? There's something that's holding both of them back. And what it is, is that they're both living in a simulated reality. San Junipero is not a real place. San Junipero is a place for the elderly and the dead. You see, they've taken their, when they're alive and they're elderly and they're in a retirement home, they're wearing some device that allows them to go into San Junipero. And upon death, this is all that remains. A digital copy of themselves inserted into a data center into the world, in this case San Junipero, where they choose to spend their time. So I just wanted to introduce that concept as, you know, is digital immortality possible? Is it purely science fiction? Many people have, people have been talking about it for years. Um, up until recently, I've thought purely science fiction, but I was doing a lot more research. And has anyone ever heard of Dmitry Iskov? Russian billionaire and entrepreneur now famous for, in 2011, founding the 2045 Initiative. And the 2045 Initiative is um, moving towards a goal of cybernetic immortality by the year 2045. And you're probably asking how. This is Dimitri on stage speaking um, at, in 2013 in New York at the Global Futures, uh, which is really just put on by the 2045 Initiative. So how? There's really four stages. We're here in 2017, still in body A, 
where the idea is to create an avatar that can be controlled by the human brain using a neural interface. Stage two is to create an artificial copy of the, of the human body that the brain can ble be transplanted into upon death. Stage three is to take a copy of that brain and instead of actually inserting the brain, but inserting that copy into the body. Stage four is a holographic body. And <laughs> one of the favorite things that I found throughout my research was all these photos, we're here in 2017, so all the, there's a lot of photos online of these avatar bodies, and they also don't really seem to think this is a great idea. <laughs> this one's my favorite, actually, because that's Dmitry Iskov's uh, avatar. That's the example that he's created. Okay, so let's maybe suspend some belief for a little bit while and say that digital immortality is a real thing, and we're on the path towards it, and then by 25, 2045, we're going to get there. What is this going to do to human interaction? How is this going to affect the way that we socialize? How is this going to affect the way that we interact as a species? Oh, I'm going to switch path that slide because it showed too much. Um, let's go back to San Junipero. Imagine, if you will, at an elderly stage in your life or once you're dead, the ability to live in a, in a simulated reality where basically all of your hedonistic desires can be fulfilled. Does that sound appealing? Some may say yes, some may say no. But I think for a large percentage of, the, of society that will be appealing versus the struggles of their everyday life, if they could go into a simulated reality where everything that they have or everything that they've wanted could be at their fingertips. It, sounds, it might sound appealing to a lot of people. Another good example is Ready Player One, Ernest Klein's uh, sci-fi classic, which is being turned into a film in 2018 by Steven Spielberg. In that trailer, they talk about Oasis, which is the massively multiplayer online game that all of the story revolves around. And, and the, the character, the main character in the story says, they call our generation the missing millions. There is nowhere left to go, nowhere but the Oasis. It's the only place that feels like I mean anything, a world where the limits of reality are your own imagination. And I just think that that's such a great way to describe the possibility or the the pull towards this virtual or simulated reality. Perhaps it's a new opiate of the masses. But everyone's not going to unplug. We still need to have a functioning society. We still need people working. People need to earn an income. We need to procreate. What I'm proposing is not that everyone's just going to suddenly unplug from life and go into this virtual reality, but that there will be a new form of retirement, a neo-retirement where people will go and live in these virtual and simulated realities on an increasing basis, maybe even a full-time basis, as we get into later stages of our life, and then eventually die and move into a simulated reality forevermore. And the point out? you might be saying, this, is, this isn't real. Like, virtual reality is just at a place where the Zuck can get up on stage and make a fool of himself and have a tone-deaf presentation about Puerto Rico and all that stuff. But to that I say, it's actually already happening. Uh, there's a company out there, I got this off their fa Facebook page, it's called um, Rendever. And they're going around and they're selling VR solutions to um, retirement homes across the US. I think they're just focusing on the US market so far. But the idea being that they can provide a better life, they can provide stimulation, you know, Granny, who's going into a retirement home, may have always wanted to see Machu Picchu, never had a chance. She can go and visit it virtually. It does sound pretty appealing, actually. So the idea of neo-retirement, and I should, what I meant to say earlier was people might actually start to check out of their physical life earlier, right? If, if government will allow it, but euthanasia so people can move over. Maybe because of climate change, it'll actually be a good thing fewer mouths to feed, few, fewer humans on Earth if people move early into the simulated world. And the last thing I want to touch on is how we will adopt. So many of you have probably seen this online. It's been going around for a little while. Uh, it's a, I just love this as a, as a way to describe social media, uh, boring from the breakfast club. Um, but just think about, it's been 15 years of social media. Think about how we've adopted it. And I'm not going to get into it, I'm not going to share all my opinions, but I just want each of you to think about your own experience on social media, how humanity's adopted it, how many of your friends are constantly looking at their social media accounts. And you, know, you might say that 
this, this doesn't really apply to virtual reality, but I'm suggesting it's a stepping stone. The average, as of 2016, the average Canadian between 18 and 34 was spending five hours a day on the internet. You know, if you're awake for 15 hours in a day, that's a third of your waking hours spent on the internet. So maybe these are just stepping stones towards a future where we're all living in a simulated reality in retirement and death. And, and this is real, perhaps. Where this, so again, this is going back to Ready Player One. And what I want to talk about for a second, again, is Oasis. So Oasis is the, is the massively multiplayer online game platform that's the crux or the, the basis of the whole storyline for Ready Player One. Um, but I want to talk about a company that, a, a fake company that I've come up. It's a bit of an homage to Oasis, and I call it Mirage. And I call it Mirage because it's something that's not really there. Um, so let's say that Mirage has this product offering. You can get your uh, digital brain reproduction, and that's sort of like the entry level. Massively multiplayer online games, you pay a little bit more for that. Communal virtual worlds where you're sharing a virtual world with a, a large number of people, like other, other real people are in that world. Or maybe you want something personalized, your own personalized virtual world. Maybe one day we'll have a robotic body as a service where you can have your, the essence of you, your brain or whatever that is, that digital copy inserted into a robot. Or maybe even through human bioengineering, a human body. But how is Mirage going to differentiate itself? There's going to be numerous VR platforms. How are they going to succeed against the competition? And my argument is that would be through personalization. So you might want to interact in a world with just people of the, well, first of all, you could choose your age, you could choose your race, you could choose your nationality. Whoever you were in this world, you don't have to be in, in another, necessarily. But what really concerns me is if these platforms were to offer products where you could choose to only spend time with people that have the same political ideologies as you, or the, same, the people who follow the same religion as you. Removing people who disagree or people who have different disbeliefs from the world that you experience when you live in the simulated reality. What I'm trying to get at is social division and isolation. If somebody's living in their own personalized world, they may be completely isolated from all other human interaction. Or maybe they'll just go and live in the world where everybody talks and thinks and feels the same way that they do. And I think that goes back to the example about social media where we create these echo chambers for ourselves, where we don't follow the people that we disagree with necessarily. So I know that I've done a lot of broad strokes and I'm gonna try to summarize. It's a 20 minute presentation and I've just sort of been able to skim the surface. The point is that I wanna have conversation and I wanna have dialogue. So if anyone has any questions or they wanna talk about this, I've really enjoyed researching for this presentation. I'd love to talk to you afterwards, so come up. In summary, Digital mortality plus the rise of virtual platforms, subtracting human interaction, multiplying by the motivation for consumer personalization will lead to a division of our society. And for me, what this all equals is a very dark future indeed. Thank you.